Welcome everyone. Welcome to this week's Hope Show. I hope each and every one of you have had a very blessed week. Thank you for tuning in today. I want to thank all the networks out there for broadcasting my show and for those of you who have added me to your weekly schedule. I am honored. And thank you to all my listeners out there for being such a great support to me. This week on the Hope Show, I want to talk about poverty. Poverty is a worldwide problem. It is not restricted to the third world countries. We all know what poverty is. Some of us may be living in poverty right now. Poverty is a state of existence where there is little or no money, lack of resources, lack of support, a condition of being poor, lacking the necessities to live. It is the deprivation of basic human needs such as food, water, sanitation, clothing, shelter, health care, and education. There are many different levels of poverty. Poverty doesn't necessarily mean that you're lacking in all of these areas. You can be considered to be living in poverty if you're only lacking in some of these areas. I looked up some facts about poverty and I was astonished at the percentages of world poverty. In fact, it seems that statistics show that the vast majority of people in this world do live in poverty each year. Why is this? That is crazy. With all the money the governments have in all the various countries and there is still poverty in this world, there is something very wrong with this picture. I believe it can be summed up in one word, greed. Let me share some of the facts that I found this week. Now these totals were updated in March of 2013. But here's what I found. Almost half of the world, over 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. 80% of the world population live on less than $10 a day. Nearly a billion people enter the 21st century unable to read a book or even to sign their own names. Less than 1% of the cost of what the world spends on weapons per year goes towards seeing that children have a good education in our schools. Think about that. Oh my gosh, really? Out of all the, the probably millions and billions of dollars spent on, on weapons all around the world, less than 1% of that total cost is spent on education. That's just, that's sad. That's unbelievable. One billion children live in poverty. That is one out of two children in the entire world. 640 million live without adequate shelter. 400 million have no access to safe water. 270 million have no access to health services. 10.6 million died in 2003 before they reach the age of five years old. That averages out to 29,000 deaths per day. Those are some overwhelming, astonishingly high numbers. When I researched and found out those statistics, I nearly fell out of my chair. It just seems unreal. I can't wrap my brain around those kinds of numbers. Not when this government the government keeps getting richer and more powerful while the average person continues to struggle and get poorer. I find that to be very horrific, very sad. It sickens me to think of all those that are doing without when there is simply no reason whatsoever for this to be happening. I wonder how these big shot government officials would feel if they were forced to trade places with the poor for let's say maybe a month, maybe six months, to really let them get a feel for how others live. 
I dare say they probably would not fare so well. In connection to the figures that I quoted you a moment ago, to break that down a little further, 29,000 deaths per day is the equivalence of one death every four seconds. And the majority of those are children. These figures are worldwide statistics. And think for a moment about the elderly and the disabled. Retirement funds and disability checks per month, they barely give you enough money to live on. After you pay all your monthly bills, let alone trying to buy any food, in a lot of cases, people have to make a choice. Pay the house payment, pay the utility or the food bill. They have to make a choice about such simple things. And heaven forbid, should you get really sick. Then, you're, basically, you are truly screwed. Can I say that on, on live radio? <laughs> I'm just calling it like it is, folks. <laughs> Most of the people cannot afford the expenses incurred should they get really sick or need medication or long-term care or find themselves hospitalized. It is pathetic that in today's world, that with all of the modern technology and the cures for different illnesses at our fingertips, that 80% of people can't even afford it. This creates emergency rooms to be oftentimes backed up wall to wall with people trying to see a doctor. Why? Because emergency rooms and hospitals are not supposed to be able to turn away sick people, even if they can't afford the care. However, once you are admitted and they find out that you don't have health insurance, they can and do give you a lesser quality of care to get you in and out so as not to cost the hospital because sadly they figure they won't be getting paid for their services so they don't want to give you the proper care by running up your bill. Maybe that is harsh of me to say. Maybe I'm being unfair to hospitals and the medical world in general. Maybe this is not how all hospitals work or operate but it has certainly been my experience and the experience of my friends that that does happen. I had a good friend a few years back. Uh, she's in her mid-twenties and she has uh, female problems. She has some cysts and so on. And uh, of course she knows her history so she knows what that feels like when, when she's uh, has something like that that's being aggravated in her body and she knows that she gets infections with it and runs high fevers and all that kind of thing and uh, a few years back she was in so much pain because she had let it go too long because she couldn't afford to go to the doctor and no one would take her because she didn't have health insurance and so one day after work, I rushed her to the emergency room and stayed there with her at a local hospital. And when they found out that she didn't have health insurance, there were a lot of things they could have done, but they didn't do. They could have ran a whole bunch more tests. They could have done a lot of, a lot of things, but they didn't. And they treated her as if, just get her in and out. She'll be fine. Just get her in and out. And she and I both were appalled at that behavior. And I'm sure that she's not the only one out there. I'm sure there's a lot of people who get treated that, that very same way. And that's just not right, folks. That's a human life. And, you know, sometimes their circumstances, their, their health, their illness, whatever is going on with them, you know, they're there for a reason. They're, they're in pain. They're suffering. They need the help. Chances are that was their last resort. And, and doctors are turning these folks away and giving them, uh, you know, half the care that they should. That is wrong. 
That's, that's almost inhumane. It doesn't seem to matter which, which country you live in either, or how wealthy or how poor that country is. Statistics say that you will always see high levels of inequity wherever you live. The cold hard facts of this brutal world that we live in is such. The poorest people will have less access to health, education, and financial support. That, I'm just being realistic. Problems of hunger, malnutrition, and disease will be the hardest hit by those in poverty. The poor are also typically outcasts of society and have, have little or no voice in public or political matters. Faced with all these obstacles, it becomes even harder to escape poverty. It seems that even the welfare and the social services and the food stamp offices will oftentimes turn away the people who are honestly trying to better themselves and give freely to the crackhead around the corner. You know, and I apologize if that's harsh, but but that is how I see it, you know. I mean, uh, the average poor individual that's still trying to hold on to whatever dignity that they may have and, and live an honest life, those are the folks that fall through the cracks of our system. That's just unfair, you know, and I know life isn't fair, but come on, it's, it's inhumane, you know, with, with all of this technology that this world has and all this money that this world has, that's just crazy to me that there are still 80% of people out there doing without and struggling day to day to live. But once again, the honest folks that, that, and I have found myself there too, you know, in, in the past, years ago when I was uh, uh, just uh, having gone through a divorce and I was a single mom and, and I was working three jobs just to keep, you know, try to keep the lifestyle that, that my daughter and I had had before, but I was still struggling with food and such and, and uh, every once in a while it was kind of difficult to pay the utility bills and so I went to a local government office and I was on food stamps for a short while just to get me over the hump. I'm not one of those that's going to, uh, you know, just drain the system. I, I truly had a need and I was only on it long enough to get myself on my feet and then I, I left that program uh, so that others that were more needy, needy than me at that moment could have that. But do you know how many hoops you have to go through just to get help? And every time I went to some place like that, they told me that that I was just on the borderline, you know, financially, that uh, uh, I, I couldn't get this because I made just, you know, slightly over the amount that qualified. Well, you know what? That's bull. That That is just utter bull. You know, because, like I said, lots and lots of people are on welfare, and it's simply because they are sitting at home, uh, and they don't, they don't want a job. You know, and that's not to say that all people on welfare are like that, but I'm saying that there are people out there who do milk the system, that are lazy, that just do not want to get off the couch and find a job, but they're content getting that government check every month. And those are the folks that seem to be able to get that money as opposed to those like myself back in that day what, that I was truly trying. I was just falling a little short. I just needed a little help. So anyway, then whenever that happens, you know, they, when you find yourself turned, turned away from help, you know, then you start to lose hope in the system. Life just seems to keep kicking, kicking you around, and you can't just seem to catch a break, and you get further and further downtrodden. While the crackhead, who couldn't care less about their dignity, their honesty, or a day's work, there are a lot of people in this world who are satisfied just to be like that, even expect to be given 
everything on a silver platter. This world is becoming more backward and less compassionate with every new generation. This is the age of, it's all about me. It's survival of the fittest. The world has been pumped up into believing that you have to be the best at whatever you do, and it's all about the competition. It doesn't matter who you have to mow down in your path, so long as you succeed with your mission. Remember, when you were a child, and there were always some child out there that it was all about them. They didn't want to share. They always wanted to have their own way. They always had to be the one to win at every game, even if it meant that they had to cheat to do so. They were spoiled, lacking discipline and values. And now you see a generation of those same children, all grown up as adults, and they still behave like that. Spoiled, uncaring, uncompassionate, insensitive whiners that will stab you in the back in a heartbeat if you're not careful and cautious around them. I'm sure we have all known or been around those types of people throughout our lifetime. You know the people I'm talking about. Nothing ever seems to be good enough. They behave as if the world owes them something. And for what? I have no idea. Nothing has ever been given to me on a silver platter. Not that I'm complaining, don't get me wrong, but I just think it's ridiculous that there are so many people in this world that do think that way. If I had behaved that way as a child, my folks would have seen to it that my bottom side glowed for a week. Um, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. I have a message on my screen. Am, am I broadcasting? Uh, is anybody out there having any difficulty hearing me? Um, just kind of text in there in the chat line, line and uh, let me know if, if everybody is able to hear me all right. Anyway, as I was saying, Okay, well, I must be broadcasting. I'm seeing some more comments down there. Thank you, Captain. Um, if I had behaved that way, my folks would have seen to it that my bottom side had glowed for a week. In my world, growing up, you just didn't behave that way. You treated people as you would want to be treated. You treated people with respect, no matter how rich or poor they were. They were all equal. You helped one another. If you saw someone struggling, you offered them a hand. I was born and raised on a farm. I lived there until I graduated from high school and left home. My folks and their neighbors all had big gardens. When it came to harvest time, it was like a huge swapping shop for miles. Neighbors shared what they had with each other, and they didn't expect anything in return. No money traded hands. You shared and you traded goods, and you were happy to do it. If someone had some farm machinery that was broke down, and the neighbors found out that you were broke down, they would go help each other in the fields or help to get the machinery up and running again. Even though I'm only in my mid-40s, it seems like another world. Seems like a lifetime ago. But you know, I live about two hours south of my folks' farm, and it hasn't changed so much in their neck of the woods. I love going home. When I go home, it's like old times. Mom and Dad still live much like they did when I was young, and still living, and still living with them. They live in the same old house that was passed down through the generations in my family on my mom's side. My aunts and uncles and grandparents all lived there before my brother and I. The living room, which is part of the original house, is well over a hundred years old. The house still sits on the same farm acreage in the same exact place, also passed down through many generations on my mom's side of the family. 
the neighbors still pitch in and help one another. They still swap garden produce with each other. They still go on the phone with each other every night at the end of a hard day's work, and they still check up on each other for miles around. It's like this huge network, and it's, it's awesome. It just seems like a different, simpler world where my roots are back on the farm, and I often miss that. Home is in mid-Missouri, a little town called Bosworth. There's a lot of history there at my folks' place. When I was a child, I didn't appreciate all the hard labor, the peace and quiet, all the experiences of the farm life. It took up a greater part of my childhood, and I had to grow up way too fast. But looking back, those were the best years of my life. I wouldn't have changed one single thing. Those experiences made me the person I am today, and I'm pretty satisfied with how I turned out. My folks weren't rich by no means. We had a lot better than some, though. My folks were very conservative with their finances and could make the most of every dollar they had and stretch it farther than most could. I have probably lived most of my life just on the verge of poverty, borderline perhaps. My folks grew a lot of food that we ate. My mom would do a lot of canning. She had big, big, big garden. And there were always fruit trees around my mom and dad's house and my, my grandparents' house. And so, you know, if you weren't working in the field, you were working in the garden. And, and you know, I can remember as a little girl, my folks picking buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of, of fruit and vegetables. And we would sit there in the the kitchen and we would prepare those things for canning and my mom would spend hours, countless hours, and my grandmother would come down and join her. And they would spend countless hours canning all the garden fruits and vegetables and, and then through the winter that's what we lived on. That's what we ate. And and you weren't picky about what you ate because that's all you had. And if you didn't need it, well, you go hungry. That's your own foolish self. My dad hunted all the time, and he would drag me along with him from time to time. I was probably about five years old. He didn't have to drag very hard, though, because I thoroughly loved hunting with my dad. I can remember as a little girl, I would go out, and uh, he would have me shake out the rabbits out of the, the brush piles. And, you know, I thought I was doing something big back in the day, you know, being a little five-year-old, tagging along with your dad, going hunting and stuff. That's pretty cool. And uh, we'd see a little rabbit run into a brush pile, and it'd be my job to get over there on that brush pile and jump up and down and shake him out. And uh, then Dad would get him. And so I, I love spending that time with my dad, and I do miss that. But, you know, to this day, I'm an avid deer hunter. I, I've deer hunt for years and years, probably the last 20 years. And I love doing that. I love being outdoors. I love camping. But anyway, that's getting off the track of my, my message for today. But to say the least, my folks were resourceful, and they taught me to be so as well. I am very blessed and fortunate because I have a lot of skills that other people don't, especially if they've lived in the city all of their life. However, by contrast, the wealthier you are, the less you worry about financial matters, and the more you spend because money is no obstacle. The wealthier people, generally speaking, often benefit from economic and political policies. They want for nothing. They don't have to worry about such things as transportation, clothing, shelter, health services, education, where their next meal is coming from, or where they will sleep tonight. It's all at their fingertips. I'm going to go ahead and take a short break right now before I continue. I'm going to play a few songs. And that will give all of us, including myself, a chance to stretch for a moment. So I hope you enjoy these few songs on the break, and I'll be right back. Welcome back to all my listeners and the networks broadcasting my show today. Thank you so much. I'm really happy that all of you could be able to be a part of my show today. I'm happy that you could join me. 
If you're just tuning in, today's message is about poverty. I've done my research this week, and I'm, I'm providing you with some really interesting facts, I hope. Uh, you may already know some of these facts, but hopefully you'll get something from my message that you did not know, perhaps. My message will give you something to think about in the upcoming weeks. If you're just tuning in after today's message is aired live, I will get this message uploaded to my podcast page on MSI Seeking Solutions Network. You can visit MSI, click on the link for the podcasts, scroll down to Hope by Beverly, and listen to this show and all the shows that I've done from the beginning, from when I first started. If there's anything you would like to share with the world, you can also Skype me during the show. With that said, I'm going to jump back into my message on poverty. I want to look at some of the causes of poverty right now. What are some of the most common causes of poverty? Poverty has many, many causes. You really can't pinpoint it to just any one reason. There are generally many variables involved in what creates that end result, poverty. Some of the most common causes include changing trends in society, cutbacks in company jobs, economics, lack of education, high divorce rates, overpopulation in some areas, environmental problems such as drought, politics, lots of natu- or, excuse me, loss of natural resources or poor management of the ones that we have, loss of ambition, loss of opportunities, and even a poor attitude about life in general can be a factor in causing poverty. Also, another bit of research suggests that poverty is primarily the consequence of the way society is organized and how the resources are allocated. However, if you want to further break down some of the causes of poverty in terms of key factors uh, of individuals, there are certain key factors that are perceived as making you more at risk. Some of these key factors include unemployment or having a very low paying job, low levels of education and skills, the size and the type of your family, the larger families and the single parent families are more prone to poverty. And even though we would like to think that in today's society that we have evolved away from such things, even gender still plays a part in poverty. And then there are a few other key factors for individuals as well. Some of those include whether you have disabilities or if you're in poor health, being a member of a minority ethnic group, being an immigrant, and living in a remote or very disadvantaged community can also be a deciding factor. Yet some other deciding factors may include changes in the cost of living in your area and individual responsibility and welfare dependency. So you see, there are many, many reasons why there is such a vast percentage of people living in poverty all over the world. It is my belief, though, that we shouldn't be seeing any poverty in this world. If any, then very little. In all the research I've done this week, poverty is explained by individual circumstances and the characteristics of those poor individuals. I myself feel that there's no excuse for having poverty in this world. If all the resources were evenly distributed between all the people and the government wasn't as corrupt as it is or as greedy as it is, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. If all the world's resources were accessible to all the people, we wouldn't have these problems. If corporations, government officials, actors, musicians, etc., were as concerned for their fellow brothers and sisters around the world as they were with lining their own pockets with as much money as possible, probably more than they can ever spend in one lifetime, then we wouldn't have these problems. Have you ever noticed, though, that no matter how wealthy the rich are, they seem to never be satisfied with what they have? They seem to always want more, and still more, and yet more. Wealth can't buy you happiness in the true sense. You can't take the money with you when you pass from this world. And how much is too much money? 
or not enough money anyway. To someone who is living in extreme poverty, a thousand dollars might as well be a million. But to someone who is already wealthy, a thousand dollars may seem like mere pennies. Pocket change. Poverty is a very complex issue. It is for certain that there is no single reason for living in conditions of poverty. It is way too complex for there to just be one problem. There is such a thing also called the cycle of poverty. When I talk about the cycle of poverty, what I'm talking about is circumstances that keep people locked into poverty. It becomes a vicious cycle that can go on for generations. Basically, because of the poverty that people are already experiencing, they and their children are unable to break from that cycle. One example of this might be, say that you live in a faraway impoverished country. You have a small child. You would like to be able to send them to school, but they are needed to work on the family farm. And for that reason, they are unable to get the education that they need. Later in life, when that child grows up and moves out to make his own way in this world, they will find it very hard to find a job. They will be limited to low-paying occupations because of their lack of education and their lack of skills. Then the cycle continues for that person and their family. This next generation is forced into poverty once again. This is just one example out of the many scenarios that I can think of that produce poverty and keep you rooted in poverty. Studies also indicate that right now in today's society that the suburbs, uh, poverty seems to be growing twice as fast as in the cities. So what if you find yourself a victim of the cycle of poverty? Then what? Here are some suggestions for trying to break free from that cycle. For many who find themselves victims of the cycle, chances are you were born into that poverty cycle. And for those people, poverty begins in childhood when the baby is first born. They enter into a cycle that is oftentimes very difficult to break, but not impossible. There is still hope. And yes, I see that uh, you're very right. Uh, there are cycles that keep people locked into wealth, too. Um, they call that, in my neck of the woods, they call that old money, where uh, just like the cycles of poverty, you have the cycles of, of wealth as well, and generation to generation also uh, reap that, too. So that's a good point. Thank you very much. You must formulate a plan, though. Uh, if, you're, if you find yourself in that cycle of poverty, it's very important to formulate a plan. Plans give children, families, and communities the tools needed to start change. These tools are designed to help break the cycle and build solutions for improving living circumstances. Some tools include getting some type of education, which will give you more skills, and knowledge of the outside world, which in turn, hopefully, will make you more suitable for a higher paying job. Finding some sort of health care. Getting access to safe drinking water. Also finding ways of improving the sanitation of your environment. That too will greatly improve your situation. Researchers say that to help break a cycle of poverty from one generation to the next, it begins with investing in the children from the time they are born until the time that they become adults. I would like to share an article with you that I found. This article was written about an individual who lives in extreme poverty. As I read this article, it certainly brought things into proper perspective for me. It's very sad. Yet there are people all over the world who experience this every day. Not everyone lives in poverty. Not everyone who, who does live in poverty experiences such extreme conditions. But let's face it, no matter where you are at in the poverty level, people all over the world are still suffering. And they're still lacking basic needs 
to survive. And, you know, it's, it's my belief that there is absolutely no reason under the sun for this. There is plenty of food and money in this world, and we should not be having this problem. But still, it remains, and, you know, it's easy, and I, I guess I'm guilty of this too, but um, when I read this article that I'm about to share with you, you know, wherever, you at, wherever you're at in this world financially, it's sometimes hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes, and it's, it's, sometimes we forget about those that are less fortunate than us because we're so busy living our own lives. And, you know, we aren't experiencing it as bad as somebody, say, around the corner or, or overseas or in another country. And so sometimes we get so busy with our lives that, that we don't think about those things. And I'm guilty as well because, um, you know, when I read, read this article, I realize just how truly fortunate and truly blessed that I am. And, boy... You know, I, I just, I really had to show some gratitude for my life after reading this. So, anyway, I want to share this with you. It's kind of lengthy, so bear with me, but it's, it's worthy of, of hearing. What is poverty? And, and keep in mind, this is a person who has been interviewed. Um, so... Anyway, here we go. Listen to me. Here I am, dirty, smelly, doing without food, and even doing without proper underwear. I smell the stench of my own rotting teeth, but I don't want your pity. I can't use your pity. Listen with understanding. Put yourself in my dirty, worn-out, ill-fitting shoes and hear me. Hear my cry for help. Poverty is getting up every morning from a dirt and illness-stained mattress. The sheets have long ago been used for diapers for my baby. Poverty is living in a smell that never leaves. This is the smell of urine, sour milk, and spoiling food, sometimes joined with the strong smell of long-cooked onions. Why onions? Because onions are cheap. If you have found yourself in this kind of extreme poverty, then you know. You have smelled these smells. But you do not know how or when it came to be. It is the smell of an outdoor privy. It is the smell of a young child who cannot hold their bladder long enough to walk the long, dark way into the night to go out to the privy or the bathroom. It is the smell of mattresses, where years of accidents have taken place. It is the smell of milk that has gone bad because the refrigerator has long ago stopped working, and there is no money to fix it. It is the smell of rotting garbage. I could bury it, but I don't have a shovel, and shovels cost money, money that I don't have. Poverty is being tired tired all the time. When I was at the hospital the last time having my baby, the doctors told me I had chronic anemia caused by a poor diet. I had a bad case of worms and I needed corrective operation. I listened politely. The poor generally are polite and listen. The poor won't tell you that they don't have the money for iron pills, better food, or worm medicine. The idea of an operation is very frightening and it costs so much money. If I dared, I would have laughed. Who will take care of my children? Recovery from an operation takes a long time. I have three children and the last time I was able to find work, I left them with Granny to come back home to them with fly flex all over their bodies, and diapers that had not been changed on them since I had left them there earlier in the morning. 
When the dry diaper came off, parts of my baby's skin came too. My other child was playing with a sharp piece of broken glass, and my oldest was found playing alone at the edge of a lake. I make $22 a week, and daycare for three children costs 20 a week. So I quit my job. Poverty is dirt. You can say, in your clean clothes, coming from your clean house, that anybody can be clean. Let me explain to you what it is like trying to keep a clean house and a clean family without money. For our meals, I try to make things that don't require many dishes to be used. What dishes I do have, which are few, I wash in cold water with no soap. Even the cheapest soap that I can afford must be saved for cleaning my baby's diapers. Look at my cracked red hands. Once I saved for two months to buy some Vaseline for my cracked hands and for my diaper for the diaper rash on my babies. By the time that I had saved enough money to buy the Vaseline for, for two months, I went to the store to purchase it and it had gone up two cents. So my family had to suffer longer for me to raise that. I have to force myself each day to put my cracked hands into the cold water and the harsh soap to do what needs to be done. You ask, why not use hot water? That costs money. Everything costs money. If you burn wood in the fireplace, it costs money to chop it up. If you are lucky enough to have electricity, that costs money. Hot water is a luxury. I cannot afford luxuries. I know you will be surprised when I tell you how young I am. I look so much older. My back is hunched from being bent over tasks every day, doing everything the hard way. I have wrinkles in my skin. My skin is tough and leathery from the harsh environment and from the lack of sleep. Poverty is staying up all night to stoke the fire with newspapers to stay warm watching that the fire doesn't get out of hand and burn the whole house down. In the summertime, poverty is watching the gnats devouring your children's tears on their faces. The screens are tore, and you pay so little for rent so you ne know that they will never be fixed. Poverty means insects in your food, up your nose, in your eyes, and crawling over you while you try to sleep. Poverty is hoping it never rains, because the diapers I have hung out on the clothesline outside will never dry as long as it's raining. And when this happens, you have to resort to using newspapers for diapers. Poverty is seeing your child with a runny nose, and them having to use newspapers for handkerchiefs. Poverty is cooking without food and cleaning without soap. Poverty is having to ask for help. Have you ever been forced to ask for help when you didn't want to because you knew that if you didn't turn loose of your pride that your family would suffer? If you need a loan, you have to ask a friend because you know that's the only chance you have of getting one. Let me tell you how it feels to ask for help. You get up the nerve to go to a place of business to ask for help. You find the office where the person you need to see is located. You circle it four or five times, not wanting to go through this experience, yet thinking of your family. That's what determines your final decision. You muster up what it takes to set aside pride and humility, and you walk into that building. A woman greets you. She asks you what she can do to help you. You explain yourself. And then, the first person you meet is never the one person you actually need to speak to. So they go in search of the person who can help you. Then you have to go through that whole speech and humiliation 
spilling out all that shame of your poverty all over again. Sometimes you get lucky and you'll find the right person to help you on the second try. But sometimes you find they aren't the person who can help you either. So you're off yet to a third person. And each time you have to repeat yourself, it gets harder and harder to do so. The shame is so great. Then you're told to wait. And while you're waiting, with each, each minute that goes by, you are filled with a mounting feeling of despair. Poverty is remembering. Remembering when you dropped out of elementary school or high school because nice, clean children made fun of you and were cruel to you because of the clothes you wore or how you smelled. Perhaps you were a little slower so, than some of the other children. The attendant of the school comes to your home my mother told him I was pregnant. More shame. Of course I wasn't, but my mother thought that it would excuse me from school. Perhaps I could find a job and help out around the house. And I did find a couple of jobs, but I didn't keep them long because I didn't have enough skills. I never, I never learned enough skills to keep a job or to get another. But mostly, I remember being married. I was very, very young. I am still young. For a while, my husband and I had all the things you have. I had a little house with hot water and some of the other luxuries that most people take for granted. Then, my husband lost his job. We lived off of unemployment for a short while. Soon our nice things were repossessed, and we were forced to move back into my mother's house, back into poverty. By this time, I was pregnant. When we first moved back to my mother's house, it didn't look so bad. But every week, it got worse. Nothing ever got fixed. We ran out of money. My husband was able to find a few odd jobs but everything he earned went for buying food, as it still does now. Looking back, I don't know how we lived through three years and three babies, but we did. But eventually, the living conditions, bringing more babies into this dirty life we live, and no money, destroyed our marriage. Do you know how much it costs for birth control? Another luxury we couldn't afford. So the babies kept coming. There were no long goodbyes between my husband and I. I hope that my husband was able to drag himself out of this poverty, because I know that with myself and the three babies, he could not have ever hoped to do so. That is when I finally was forced to ask for help. Help came in the amount of $78 a month to support the four of us. That is all I'm qualified to receive. Can you believe that? So now, can you see why there is no soap, no aspirin, no hot water, no shampoo? I pay rent. I do have some electricity now. But if I use too much electricity, then that means less money for food. So we can serve and we do without using very much electricity. Poverty is looking into a black future. Your children won't play with my children. My children have no extra books or toys, paper or crayons. Most importantly, my, my children don't have access to health care. They have worms, pink eye, and other infections all summer long. We do not have beds, so we sleep on floors and sleep is hard to come by. They do have some health clinics to help people in poverty, but they are many miles away. I have no transportation, so I would have to walk those miles. Yes, I could, but could my small, sick children? I have neighbors that could take me when they go to town, but they all expect to be paid for gas. 
I bet you might know my neighbor. He is that fellow that spends all his time at the gas station, the barber shop, or the corner store, complaining about those immoral mothers of illegitimate children. Poverty is an acid that drips on pride until it's worn away. Poverty is a chisel that chips away at a person's honor until there is no honor. Some of the, the some of you might say that if you were in my situation you would do something. And maybe you would for the first week or month. But what about year after year after year? Even the poor can dream. They dream of a time where there is money. Money for the right kind of food. For medicine when they're ill. For iron pills. For toothbrushes and shampoo. They dream of a time when they can buy a hammer or a shovel. Some screen to repair the windows and the doors. Maybe a bit of paint. Or some needle and thread to mend their threadbare clothes. They dream of a time when there is money to travel to town, money for hot water and electricity any time you want it, money for soap. They dream of a time when asking for help doesn't eat away at the last bit of pride that they have, when the offices you visit are kind to you and polite, when they look at you with respect and not disdain. When the workers themselves don't quit on you in despair and defeat. They dream of a time when you don't have to prove your poverty over and over and over again, being shuffled from one person and yet another. I am the voice of poverty. I came out of my despair just long enough to share my story with you, my life. Remember, I do not come from some other place, some faraway land, or yet another time. Others like me are all around you. Folks, having read that article absolutely breaks my heart in two. This poor woman let go of her shame, her pride, long enough to share that story with the world, to give the world an idea of what poverty looks like. I commend her for that. I don't know if I'd had that much courage. I don't know if I'd been brave enough because you know how folks are in this world. They look down on you. And if, you know, if they don't say anything, that look in their eyes tells it all. And you know, it's not just this woman. As I read, this is the voice of poverty. This is what poverty looks like in its raw sense. And there are 80 percent of people living in poverty this year. 29,000 deaths. One every four seconds. And the majority of those people are children. Now granted, not all 80 percent of the population live in such extreme conditions as this woman. But they do struggle day to day. They are doing without some of the most basic needs. It's very sad because there's absolutely no reason in the world for this to be happening. Other than those great greedy high officials out there these greedy governments. 
that simply just don't even care. I apologize for that article being so long, but I felt that it was very worthy to share. Because that is the face of poverty. As you've listened to me reading the article, how does that make you feel? Knowing that 80% of people all over the world experience some form of poverty. Some, ex some cases are more extreme than others. How does that affect you to think that the majority of that 80% are children? Children don't have a say about what living conditions they are brought up in. And what I think of this article and of the number of people out there who are struggling with such things, it makes me physically ill to my stomach. Physically ill. I just want to cry. It just, I just want to cry. You might say, I feel for those living in poverty, but there's nothing I can do about it. You might say, oh wow, that's, that's horrible. Thank God it's not happening to me or my family. And yet some of you might not even flinch when you think of these people struggling to survive. You may think, it's not my problem. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you for being so heartless, for being so cold. Shame on you, because poverty is our problem, too. We are supposed to be fellow brothers and sisters of one another. We are supposed to carry one another's burdens. We are supposed to share with the less fortunate. We are supposed to show compassion and be our brother's or sister's keeper. I feel sorry for people with that mindset. That poverty isn't our problem. I want to go ahead and play a song or two here for you folks. And I'll be right back. Welcome back, dear friends. I'm glad you could join me on my show today. Um, before the break, we were talking about, um, I had, I had read you an article about what the face of poverty looks like. And I was talking about, uh, the mindset of some people that, you know, they think there's nothing I can do. Or maybe they'll think, oh, that's horrible, but thank God that's not me. And yet some people might not even flinch thinking about those people in poverty. And I was talking about if you are one of those people who isn't bothered by it, who doesn't feel any compassion for those who are struggling, shame on you. Shame on you. Because poverty is our problem. We are supposed to be the fellow brothers and sisters of one another. We're supposed to carry one another's burdens. We're supposed to share with the less fortunate. We are to show compassion and be our brother or sister's keeper. I feel sorry for people with that mindset, that poverty isn't their problem. Life has many twists and turns. Most of the people all over the world live paycheck to paycheck. Most of us are one lost job, one cutback, or layoff away from poverty ourselves. Think about that for a moment. Let's be realistic about our own finances. If something major changed in your life tomorrow, God forbid, maybe you had a heart attack and you ended up in the hospital. Or maybe you were in a wreck and ended up in the hospital. Maybe uh, 
you had some accident that left you disabled, or even worse, um, left you in a nursing home with long-term care. What if you lost your job or, you know, just there's so many things out there that are tragic that could happen to you. But if one major thing changed in your life tomorrow, think about that for a moment. How long could you survive living the lifestyle that you are currently living? A week? A month? A few months? Maybe up to six months? I would be willing to bet that the majority of us out there would feel a big pinch in our lifestyle in the matter of less than a month. There are a lot of people in this world that haven't had the luxury of making more money per, per month than what their expenses are, allowing them to accumulate a savings for just such an emergency. Some of us have been able to and they will fare much better and longer than the rest of us. But think about that. Wouldn't you want help? Wouldn't you want someone to show a little compassion to you and your family? Wouldn't you hope that someone would take a little mercy on you and offer to give you a ride or buy you a sandwich or a bottle of water? Wouldn't you hope that your neighbor who has that huge garden full of ripe fruits and vegetables out back that maybe would spare you a little of that food? Or perhaps offer to let you use your shower to clean up once in a while? I have never understood how can, people can simply turn the cheek, turn their back on people when they see them struggling. I see it all the time. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't justify it for me. You know, I mean, like I said earlier, I'm in my mid-40s, and, and I've seen quite a lot of things in my life, but it's still, it, it just bothers me. I've never understood how you can be too little long down the road or in the grocery store or wherever you may be going in your life. And, and people are too busy to care, too busy to notice, too busy to, to offer a hand to help, too busy to see that someone's even struggling at all. That's just wrong. That behavior seems so backward to me and even cruel. I help people all the time. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm not trying to make it seem as if I'm better than, than anyone else. The reason that I share my experiences with you here on the radio is not to make myself look bigger and better than anybody else. Because I share, you know, other things in my life with you folks, too. You guys are all good friends to me, and, and you're like an extended family out there to me. And so, you know... It, some sometimes I I share things that uh, uh, puts myself out there on a limb to you folks, you know, for judgment or whatever. But I do that as well as I share the good and the bad. Number one, so that you know that I am not any better than any one of you out there. That I suffer the same trials and tribulations that you folks do. But to also maybe encourage you to be more compassionate, to be more aware, to be encouraged, to challenge you to do more, be better. But I help people all the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little different from most people, I suppose, because I feel people's thoughts and feelings as they're standing before me, or even as I'm driving down the road, it's, 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 I don't know, weird isn't the word, uncanny, I, ironic, I don't, I don't know what word you would use for that, but I can be driving down the street and look over at someone walking down the sidewalk, and it's like a little movie flash that goes in my head. 
and I see what their life is or what they're going through that very moment. And I feel whatever it is that they're, they're feeling. If they're distraught and struggling, I sense it. I, I have a very tuned in discernment for people. And I am full of compassion for people. You know, I've spoken some of my other shows that I haven't always had a, a, an easy life either. Back probably 13 years ago by now, maybe 14, I made a, a stupid choice in my life that I paid for dearly. I found myself having lost my home, my career, my, my marriage, my car. I went to rock bottom. I know what that poverty feels like. Maybe not in the extreme sense of the lady in the article that I, I read to you, but, but I know what that feels like. And I don't ever want anybody to feel that way, to experience that. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. That is a god-awful place to be. And you don't want to be there. And so I am full of compassion for people and for their circumstances and for what they are going through. And, you know, there was a time when, you know, I, I wouldn't even have wished that upon myself, but I, I created that mess, and I had to deal with it, and I had to live with it. But you know what? It helped me make me the person that I am today, along with all the other factors in my life from the day that I was born up to this point in life. Everything that has happened to me has made me the person that I am, and I'm pretty satisfied with that. I wouldn't want to be any other way. So, you know, I can usually take one look at someone, be talking to someone, asking them how they are doing, and immediately see it in their eyes or feel certain, a certain presence that doesn't jive up with what they are verbally telling me. Like, I'll ask them how they're doing and they'll say, oh, I'm doing great. But that is not what their eyes are telling me. That is not what their body language is telling me. Instantly, I know better. I listen. I pay attention. I analyze. I watch people's body language and I look deep into their eyes. You know, a person's eyes are the windows to their soul. Have you ever thought about that? A person's eyes are the window to their soul. And if you really care about human beings, you will take the time to learn that about them, to listen to them, to fine-tune the ability to read between the lines. Everything may seem well and good on the surface, but in reality, it is not. How many times have you yourself been asked, how are you doing today? And you're having a bad day, you don't feel good, life is crap. But you tell that person with a smile, Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Bull. It's bull. Why did you tell them that? Probably the main reason is that you don't think that they really want to know the truth. You know, that everybody's just being cordial in life. Everybody's just going through life, just being polite to one another and cordial. Because you don't want everybody to know. And you think that nobody else wants to know. The truth today is crap. And so you tell them, everything's great. Well, I'm here to tell you that when you tell me that line, I know better. I want to share something with you about myself. I've always worked in customer service jobs until recently, since I graduated from high school. My last employment was at a convenience store where I worked for 11 and a half years before I retired. 
we live in a small community, so over the years, I got to know all my customers on a personal level. They became my extended family. We would visit while they were at the checkout counter, and I would learn many things about their life. I watched their children grow up. I knew when they had special occasions in their family, such as a wedding, or a vacation, or a new birth. I also knew when there was a death in their family. I even became aware of their health, their health issues that they faced every day. I knew if they had transportation. I knew when it broke down. I knew if they didn't have transportation in the first place, and I knew when they were on foot. There was this older man, maybe 60-ish. He was living in poverty. His grown children sponged off of him what little income he had coming in that he got from the government. They would come over and eat his meager food supply. He had no transportation. He tried to go to the lo local food pantries to get food, but he had to walk to pick it up and he didn't have enough arms to carry it back home. And his feet were both bad, so walking was nearly impossible to begin with. It would take him 45 minutes to, to an hour to walk a few blocks round trip. He couldn't afford cigarettes all the time, so he would walk all over town and pick out cigarette butts from the trash at all the local businesses. Every time I saw this man walking around town, I would give him a ride wherever he needed to go and take him home because I knew he was in a lot of pain. And chances are I was on, on a, a time limit or, or maybe I was going to the grocery store and I was going home and, and I had things going on and, and I was in a hurry, but that didn't matter to me. That person needed somebody needed help, needed assistance, needed me. And that was far more important than the fact that I was tired, I was in a hurry, I needed to go to the grocery store, I needed to do this, I needed to do that. And that's what I'm saying, folks. Don't be so busy that you forget how important it is to help one another. I knew this man was in a lot of pain. I could see it. He walked hunched over. He just took baby steps because he hurt so bad. And when I would see him walking around town, I'd pull over. And he knew me because uh, the place where I worked at was one of the places that he frequented to uh, use the ATM machine to check his balances, you know, see if his government money had came in and how much he still had in his bank account. And, and he would frequent, you know, my place of business for the cigarette butts in the trash can. And so I knew him. And I would pull over. And I would offer to give him a ride, take him wherever he needed to go, to help him get food, to help him get cigarettes, to help him to get back home so that he wouldn't hurt so bad, and it wouldn't take him so long. And occasionally, I would buy him a pack of cigarettes. I wouldn't tell him, because this man had a lot of pride, too, and he didn't, he didn't want a handout. And he would never ask for help, but he was grateful when you offered it. And he showed gratitude. And I would be working and I would see him outside going through those cigarette butts in the trash can. And I would ask my boss if someone could take my, take my place at the cash register for just a moment. And I would buy that man a pack of cigarettes and I would go out there and I would put my arm around him and I'd say, here, take this. You know, because it broke my heart to see this man out there struggling for a cigarette butt. You know, I mean, 
cigarette, those dirty cigarette butts, you know, they've been in somebody else's mouth, possibly rained on, you know, just any number of things. And I didn't want to see that man going through that. And I've always been this way. When I see people in need, I try to stop and help them. More people need to be doing this. I'm going to have Shaziz on here in a few moments. Um, but more people need to do this. More people need to be compassionate. More people need to, to start noticing the people around them. <laughs> Best smoke. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The per person never knows. That was a comment on the <laughs> in the chat room. <laughs> oh, anyway, <laughs> a person never knows when their life may turn around horrible, turn around for the worse, and they might find themselves in those very same circumstances faced with poverty. I'm running out of time with my show. So I'm going to turn my show over to Shaziz here for a moment for any last-minute comments that he might have on, on the topic of poverty. Hey, everybody. Uh, we got a smiley face war going on in there. It looks like a fat finger to keys again. I said LPRD Manners is a smiley face champion to beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks out there in this world with a lot of needs. And there's nothing that we can't accomplish together. This show, uh, Beverly's Hope Show, uh, is testament to what we can accomplish. And we were talking about it just a little bit ago about how people think that no matter what they do, it's just not seeming to make a difference. If we all start to believe that we can't make a difference, then we go backwards. As long as we're out there at least making the effort then we're moving forwards. We're putting those positive pebbles in the pond. And we can feed the hungry. We can take care of it all. We can we can make this world a better place. Peace and love, everyone. Thank you, Shaziz. I always like to have my, my husband right there at the end. It's kind of became a tradition for my show to have my husband join me at the very end. Thank you for that message. We do all need to move forward, and we all can make a difference. If each and every one of us out there do our part, no matter how big or little that is, we can make a difference. We can change one person, one life at a time. I want to thank all of you for joining me here on the Hope Show today. It really means a lot for, to me to have all of you out there listening and supporting me and and encouraging me and and uh, you know, I just love all of you and I wish all of you the very very best in everything that you do and I pray that none of you out there find yourselves in that extreme poverty you know and if you are struggling out there right now no matter what your struggle is I hope and pray that your circumstances will turn around soon and I do care. And I don't I don't want anybody struggling. So anyway folks, thank you for joining me on the Hope Show today. God bless each and every one of you. I hope you have a very blessed week. Please think about my message as you go about your week. Train yourself to pay more attention and be willing to take the time out of your own busy day to, to help someone who needs it. Try to be more surrounding of, or excuse me, try to be more aware of your surroundings. You know, try to, try to be more aware of, of, and think, be thinking about what can I do? How can I be of service? How can I make a difference? Maybe you never noticed your neighbor. Maybe you never noticed the person who's working with you. Maybe you never noticed that person 
uh, sitting in the back row of church. Take time to notice this week. You might learn something. And you might find that you can be of assistance to somebody. That you can share something that you have. That you can make their life better in some small way. You know, even if it's just, you know, one time Shaziz and I were, uh, it was the middle of summer, and we were up in a local town, pretty good sized town, and there was this, oh, boy that looked to be like a, maybe a teenager, an upper age teenager possibly, and he was sitting out front of a pawn store. And he was holding a banner, a sign, you know, an advertisement for the store, trying to, to get people to come in and, and visit the pawn store. And I don't know who he was working for, but Shaziz and I was in that town for quite a while. We were in that town for the better part of the day, and it was in the, the beaten hot part of the summer. And we were checking out thrift stores and such, and, and we were having fun about our day. And we went past this business several times. And the same boy was sitting out there holding the same sign in the scorching hot summer heat in the sun. He had no shade, uh, didn't even look like he moved from that spot. And the more times that my husband and I passed that poor guy holding that sign out in that heat, the sorrier we felt for him because it was hot. I mean, it was in the 90s, way up into the 90s, and he had no shade. He didn't even appear to have a drink out there. And after a while, a few hours later, my husband and I was like, you know, that's wrong. That poor man has got to be suffering out there. And by this time, he was sitting in a chair, and he was stooped over the sign, resting his head on the sign, because he was so hot and so tired, and probably bored out of his mind as well. But, you know, he just, that poor man was sitting in the same spot, time after time after time, for hours. And my husband and I... <laughs> No, we didn't give him a sign. <laughs> well, actually, we did give him a sign. It's, it depends upon how you think about that. Um, we we decided that, you know, we didn't have much money at the time, but that it didn't matter if we had enough money. We had some pocket change. We could get him a drink. And, you know, we went to the nearest local gas station, and we bought him, like, three large bottles of Gatorade. And we pulled up next to him, and I jumped out of the car, and I handed him these three bottles of Gatorade. Now, keep in mind, I'm a complete stranger, and I'm not going there for shopping purposes. The only thing I want is to give this man some relief. And so I just handed him three bottles of Gatorade, and I told him that, you know, I hope, I hope that helped. And that my husband and I had been driving by there for hours and had seen him. And we acknowledged his hard work and the fact that he was out there in the heat and we just wanted to do something to help. And you know, that boy just looked at me like, what do you want? Why are you doing this? You know, it is sad that in today's society that when you do a good deed for somebody, that they look at you with such a dumbfounded look as if, what's this? What do you want? Why are you doing that? This just this dumbfounded look. And he was happy. He was grateful. He thanked us. But he still had that look of shock on his face, 
Well, I turned around and got back in the car and we drove off. Folks, it doesn't matter how little you have to offer or how much you have to offer. You can't tell me that you don't have a dollar fifty in your pocket that you can go get a bottle of water for somebody. That's all it takes. Changing one person, one life, one circumstance at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go on up out of here with a few songs. But do be thinking about that this week. Challenge yourself. Ask yourself, what can I do? How can I be of service? Train yourselves to pay more attention and be willing to take the time out of your busy day to help someone who needs it. Not only will they be blessed, but you will be blessed as well. Until next Saturday, same time, same place, every one of you out there, please take care of yourselves and your family this week and help your fellow brothers and sisters in this world. God bless. I love you.